Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. When I look at the uh, attendee list so far, it looks like we are represented around the globe, and I think that stands as testament to what an issue data growth has become for all of us in the data center. My name is Bob Cohn. I am Product Specialist for Spectrologic. You will not be hearing much from me today because Spectra is very excited to uh, be presenting Dick Sapler from the Aberdeen Group. Even though the name of this webinar is uh, titled Tape, the Ultimate Storage Tier, I think it might be more appropriately uh, called Big Data and What Are You Going to Do With It? And Dick is going to give us uh, many insights on that, how to work with the, the uh, unlimited data growth we seem to be experiencing, and how to tear through some of the problems that we've had. For those of you who are not familiar with Dick via his numerous writings, articles, blogs. Uh, he is coming to us from the Aberdeen Group, but before that, he spent 18 years as Senior Product Manager with Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, as we uh, sometimes uh, have fondly called them. He went from digital to NEC to eGenera, so he has uh, not only come to us as, as an analyst and an observer of what is going on in the market, he has a history of actually walking the walk, of, of working in data centers, of, of solving some of the problems that we see today. Uh, so with that, uh, Dick, I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you to lead us in this conversation. Great. Uh, thanks, Bob. That was a very generous introduction. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, host this webcast for you. Um, basically, um, what I'm going to be doing today is, is bringing you up to date and presenting some of the uh, research findings that I have uh, as a result of looking at storage, looking at servers, uh, looking at data, uh, and, uh, and kind of the new trends in technology for today. But first, I'd like to introduce to you, uh, you know, who we are at Aberdeen, and then talk a little bit about uh, the concept of big data. Um, and then uh, really get into one of the core strategies for uh, managing storage um, that's uh, becoming more and more popular in, in enterprises that I see, uh, and it's a concept called storage tiering. Um, and then we're, I'm actually going to uh, show you how tiering can make a difference in uh, the way you manage your storage. And then finally, we're going to price out about 100 terabytes of storage using the different tiers. And I'll then graphically present to you how uh, uh, tiering can uh, reduce the cost of storing larger and larger amounts of data. And then finally, the really key message that I want you to take away from this webcast is the role of tape it, as being a tier within that archiving uh, or in the, in the storage strategy. So um, a full copy of the report is available at the uh, website below. And, um, and please uh, feel free to download it. It has all the data that I'll be presenting today. OK, so who is Aberdeen Group? Um, we're an analyst group based in Boston, Massachusetts, where it's right now about 8 degrees. Um, and what we do is we survey end users um, about their actual experiences with deploying certain technologies. You know, we're part of the Hart Hanks group, a, a leader in, uh, in uh, marketing services. And so I have access to their uh, 2.5 million member IT database. And, uh, I, and I can survey those people and find out you know, what it is they're really wrestling with and how they're managing uh, their IT infrastructure today. And then what we do is we identify what we call the best in class, uh, which is the top 20% of the users. And then we, uh, we write about what that uh, best-in-class group is doing so that they make recommendations for others who are wrestling with the same features. Uh, the best-in-class seem to get a better return on their investment uh, in IT technology. And so really what we do is uh, this is really the result of a survey that I did in uh, January, about a year ago. And, uh, and we got about 100 survey responses of uh, customers of all sizes. And, um, and then we're really going to find out what the best in class are doing, and that's uh, really the results of what I'm going to show you today. So first, um, you know, I do about five or six surveys a year, and uh, we always ask, um, you know, what are the top pressures that are driving you uh, in managing your IT infrastructure? And almost literally every single survey I do, the number one pressure cited by IT professionals is managing the increasing demands for storage. It is relentless. 
um, the rising amounts of data, the different types of data, and having to uh, you know store that, manage it, um, and give it a home and protect it is really a challenge for IT today. Um, and you can see as a result of the survey, the IT professionals that I surveyed rated managing the storage harder than even managing the reducing of budgets or the managing of outages, uh, kind of you know key IT deliverables that have been around since day one. So really, managing big data is always uh, seems to be the number one pressure of being an IT professional. And it's, uh, it's really no wonder when you look at the growth rates that uh, people tell us that they're experiencing with their data, uh, you can see, see how this works. So for example, um, we asked people how, to tell us how fast their data grew from 2010 to 2011, because I did this in 2012 in January. This is looking back a year. This is a year of, uh, of real data growth. You can see that overall, uh, data growth grew at about 35%. That means it doubles every 2.5 years. Um, even small enterprises, who you think aren't re are kind of immune to this sort of uh, thing, their average data growth rate was about 25%, mid-sized 35%, and the large enterprises, it almost doubles uh, every, every two years. 8% um, of the respondents told us that our, their data grew between 90 and 140%, and there were 6% of the survey respondents said that their data grew over 150%. So, um, and this is made up of uh, what's called structured data. Structured data is that that fits very neatly into databases, kind of rows and columns, very organized. But really the high growth is coming from what's called unstructured data. That would be email, video, social media, e-commerce. And that's uh, got the largest uh, growth rates uh, associated with that, that form of data. The other thing that's going on is that there's a lot of pressures on corporations to save their data for longer periods of time. Um, this is coming from regulators, from government, <laughs> from different types of groups that are, uh, are you know, industry um, uh, organizations. And so I got the, um, the retention schedule from a large pharmaceutical company that's based here in Boston. And I went through it and looked and literally one-third of the class of data that they have, uh, they're required to hold that data indefinitely. Uh, so I just went through and took a couple of examples of the sort of information that they're required to store. And if you look at things like hazardous material information, and anytime an employee is exposed to hazardous material, all that data has to be saved basically into perpetuity. Um, drug production information, everything. Uh, from the, uh, the, the tests, the clinical trials, um, you know, even the sales results and where they went, they have to keep that data for the life of the drug and 30 years. And the most surprising one is when they do human drug tests and do the actual uh, trials on people, they have to track those people and keep, uh, you know, of how long they're living, keep track of them, and keep the data past the life of the last living recipient and then 30 years more. So you can imagine the amount of data that these companies are uh, required to store. And this data isn't just archivable. You can't just stick it on tape and bury it at an old coal mine. This data gets called up all the time as a result of lawsuits, of FDA inquiries, financial reviews, investor requests. This data really has to be available all the time um, you know, at any, any moment it could be requested. And so this really has to be considered to be in storage and not archived. So really the IT challenge that we're talking about today is that if your storage is increasing by 30% on average a year, how do you keep your, your IT spending uh, on the storage portion of your budget? How do you keep that from growing at 35% a year? Because right now, you know, IT spending from 2011 to 2012 grew about 3%. And on average, customer, companies pay about 8 to 18% of their budget on storage. And so if you allow that storage portion to grow at the 35% a year rate uh, for three years, then eventually the storage would, uh, would consume about 20 to 44% of the IT budget. And you just can't have that. That leaves nothing left 
for any new investments in any new applications or new directives uh, from management. So really the challenge is, is how do you grow your capacity by 35% a year without growing your spending? And that's really what we're gonna talk about through the rest of this presentation. So let me introduce the concept of storage tiering. Um, and really it's, it's fairly simple uh, concept. And, uh, and that's because there are all different types of media in which you can store data. They're very expensive drives, uh, they're fast drives, there's solid state disks, there's tape, um, there's different speeds of disks and so forth. But the basic philosophy is that you put your most important, most accessed data on the fastest and most reliable storage media. And then as that data ages um, or it's accessed less frequently, you set it up to either manually, uh, which is not the preferred way to do it, but automatically move that data down to less reliable, slower, therefore less expensive storage media. And so you should have multiple tiers as the data goes through what we call its half-life. So data has a half-life. Um, you think about data and how, um, how important it is, and then as it ages, it becomes less important. So for example, a stock quote. Um, you know, that has a half-life of about five minutes because, you know, you can get another one and it's probably changed. But a baseball score, that has a half-life of about a day because the next day there's another game and people want to move on and, and pay attention to what the, the, the latest uh, results are. And finally, you know, you write a report for your company. It's probably very topical and interesting to people for about a month or a quarter. But then, you know, things have changed. People have moved on. And, uh, and that data, all of this data, can then be relegated down to slower media, less reliable, therefore cheaper media. And that's really the concept of storage tiering. So um, let me show you then what uh, the, the best in class have been able to do. But let me give you a little bit more insight into uh, data and, uh, and how it's becoming a bigger challenge to manage it. So we look at what's called big data, and you'll hear a lot about that in the marketing uh, area right now. It's kind of a go-to-marketing message around a lot of storage companies and uh, uh, data management, data mining, ERP-type applications. Um, so first we talk about the volume, which is you know, the size of this data. Like I said, um, it's growing at about 35% a year, and are you dealing with uh, terabytes or gigabytes or um, uh, yottabytes worth of data? Secondly, the speed. Um, how fast, it's also the velocity. How fast is this data entering your company? Um, you know, there are a lot of applications now like SAP that actually do in-memory processing. Uh, they take the data and put it right into memory in the computers to deal with it right away uh, before it has any chance to age or um, become useless. Um, and so you see a lot of ERP applications doing that sort of thing today. And finally, you have the last one, which is you know, variability, which is the data types, like we talked about, structured versus unstructured, video, email, you know, uh, data backups, which is becoming a larger portion of the uh, data IT professionals are required to store, as well as social media. So really, how you deal with all of these things will directly impact the cost and the way you uh, deal with uh, managing your storage. So I, I have to deal with this topic right away and get this on the table and make sure people aren't uh, still uh, keeping an old idea alive in their minds that tape is only appropriate as an archive media. Tape is really a storage media, particularly when it's um, used in the way uh, that's advocated by the uh, Active Archive Alliance and by companies like Spectrologic. Um, Tapes are, um, when you have the metadata of a tape on a server, it is searchable. And so um, users can find the report or the data field that they need um, by querying just like they would any other storage media. And with the concept that Spectrologic has about robotics uh, pulling out drawers of tapes and mounting them up and spinning that tape right to the requested file, you can actually have your, your files delivered to you within minutes. So tape is really a storage media. Yes, yeah, it's used in archives, and companies like Iron Mountain have literally caves and caves load of old tapes. But you need to include 
the kind of new thinking that uh, this big data requires, the tape is really a storage media. And we'll show you how that works in a little bit. Okay, so I told you about how Aberdeen identifies best in class. And for this particular study, what we did was we identified the top 20% of organizations uh, using three metrics. The first is, you know, how long do you, does it take your organization to recover an archived file? And you look at the wide discrepancy uh, in the responses, the average responses between, you know, best in class, the average, which is the middle 50% of respondents, and what we call laggards, which are the bottom 30%. And you can see that the best in class can recover an archive file in, on average, 20 minutes. And that's an average. There were, there were companies that had a minute or two as, as their response to this question. On at, which me, it shows you that their archives are active. You know, they're searchable, they're addressable, and the data gets, and the files get to them within uh, several minutes. The average company, that's the 50%, that 2.4 hours probably corresponds to them having on-site tape. Um, so they get a request, IT has to go find the tape, mount it, you know, spin it to the right location, uh, and then uh, download the requested file. But when you look at laggards, 44 hours, that pretty much corresponds to them having the tape off-site, and uh, where they have to put in a request to a company like Iron Mountain, and somebody gets in a goes around into a cave and finds the right tape and puts it on a truck and drives it to the, the company, and it's usually you know the next day that the thing arrives. So the really wide discrepancy in this area, but you can see that best in class are really on top of this. When you talk about 20 minutes on average to recover an archive file, uh, that's pretty tremendous. The next two characteristics are really more uh, indications of well-managed IT organizations. You know, how many business interruptions have you had over the last 12 months? Best in class have averaged uh, only half or, or one every two years, whereas the laggards 3.3 a year. And then finally, how long were you down? You know, about um, 40 minutes for, the, for best in class versus laggards being down 11 hours. Obviously, there's some companies there that are really hurting as far as their ability to maintain their IT infrastructure. But you can see the, using these metrics, this is how we identified the best in class. So the rest of this presentation is basically showing you how the best in class manage their storage and how they use storage tiering. Okay, so the best in class, we asked first, how many storage tiers do they have? And you can see that on average, uh, best in class companies have about three levels of uh, tiering. So they have the, the, the top tier where the newest and freshest data exists, a middle tier where uh, the data is slightly less useful, less ac accessed uh, fewer times, and then finally the bottom tier where the data goes to rest. Um, I did, uh, I have talked to companies that have uh, as many as nine tiers in their, uh, their storage infrastructure, and that seems to me to be a bit of an overkill because quite frankly, the differentiation between the, the data values and, uh, and the financial benefits you gain, they really blur when you start having that many tiers. So on average, think about three tiers um, is what best-in-class organizations are doing. So I then asked them to tell me, what is it that you're actually using in your tier, top tier? This is tier one, the, the most important data just arrives, the data everybody wants. And there's really three dimensions to the answer. The first is the type of device that you store the data on. So the, the choices there are SSDs, uh, solid state disks. Uh, these are becoming more and more popular, particularly as the price starts to decline. Fiber channel uh, hard drives, these are the most reliable. They've been around forever, uh, hard disk drives. And then you have the, um, the slightly less reliable SATA and SAS. And then you have how fast do those drives spin, because obviously the the faster the head spins, the faster it can get the data to the head that reads the data and, it, and faster to recover the information off the disk. So you can see that the faster speeds, uh, the 15K and the 10K predominate in tier one with, uh, with none 7.5K drives uh, represented. And finally, uh, a major contributor to the uh, cost of storage is the way you protect that data with a RAID. Um, and that's a random array of independent disks. That's what RAID stands for. But basically, it's the schema that you use to protect the data 
if there's a failure in the hard disks. And hard disks still are, um, have uh, failure rates. Um, they're the only uh, product that's still in the IT infrastructure that spins, that actually moves. And anytime you have a device that moves, that's where you're going to have the most uh, failures. And you can see that, uh, you know, RAID 0, that's where you just have uh, two disks. There's no parity. It's really fast, but there's no protection for the data whatsoever. Um, RAID 10, there's two disks. There's some parity. You have to have about 5% or 10% more capacity uh, for those parity bits. Uh, RAID 5, you're now able to stripe across multiple disks, but you need to have a spare, a full spare drive. And this protects you in the case that a, a drive uh, goes down, the spare drive is there, and then you can rebuild your RAID. Um, and then finally, the newest version is uh, RAID 6. This actually stripes across multiple drives. Uh, it still requires a spare drive, but it allows you to protect against a loss of two drives. So really a, um, a very, very high level of uh, data protection for RAID 6. And so what you see here is that in Tier 1, pretty much all the expensive options are being utilized. The fiber channel drives, solid state disks, the fastest uh, spinning drives, and RAIDs five, uh, 10 and 5, um, which require uh, parity calculations and also spare drives uh, for data protection. So this is obviously going to be the most expensive type of uh, configurations you would have in your, in your storage arrays. If I then ask the best in class, what are you using in, uh, for tier two, this is the next tier down, what you see is, is that um, things have uh, moved down, have migrated down to less expensive and, and slower devices. For example, there's no solid state disk represented in tier two. Uh, and that's because solid states are very, still relatively expensive when compared to hard disk drives. Um, what used to be 46% of um, fiber channel drives now goes down to about 22%. And the vast majority of the data is on SAS and SATA drives. Uh, you also see now the 7.5K drives are starting to emerge. Uh, they're about 8% of the volume. Um, the 10K RPMs went uh, uh, from 15 to 33%. And that's at the expense of the 15K drives. They were at 46. They went down to 25%. Uh, now, that 33%, that's an answer uh, for no factor. Uh, we let the, um, the, the end users tell us that they really don't care the speed of the drives and if it's a factor in their tiering strategy. So about 33%, about a third of the respondents, um, they reported that speed of the drive doesn't really factor in their tiering strategy. Um, when you look at the uh, choice of RAID, you can see that uh, the RAID 10, which was the fastest, has declined from 46% to 17%. Um, RAID 6 went from 8 to 0, and really 41% um, uh, uh, now is uh, saying that the RAID really doesn't matter, uh, particularly with the dominance of RAID 5. Uh, there's really not a great impact on the cost of the hard drives. So finally, uh, Tier 3 um, I didn't want to produce a whole table on this because, I, quite frankly, I didn't get enough uh, really strong data to present it to you as if it was uh, as strong as the Tier 1 and Tier 2. But a couple of trends emerged. Uh, about 22% use tape now as their uh, ultimate uh, tier, Tier 3. Uh, another 22% have started actually to move their, their data into the public cloud. And we're seeing this more and more as the cost of storage in the public cloud uh, goes down and down. And, and what you probably don't know is that tape is used quite extensively uh, in cloud storage, uh, particularly the spectrologic type of uh, infrastructure where they can recover the files uh, quickly and rather than having to archive them and taking hours to get them back. Um, you see the lower cost drives exclusively, SATA and SAS, no fiber channel drives are used in, the, in tier three and lower. And finally, a really dominance of 7.5 K RPM drives and, and RAID 5 um, RAID configurations. So uh, that was quite a, uh, those last three slides were fairly technical and fairly detailed oriented. But what they allowed me to do then was to actually go and price then, and this is what it's all about. I mean, we're all trying to uh, save money because that's what you really buy beer with, um, is what is the, the cost then of a tier one versus a tier two type of storage strategy. 
And so I went to a uh, distributor that I uh, used to work with, and I asked him to price out um, 100 terabytes of storage um, using the RAID and media configurations that I just showed you in the previous slides. Um, this was done in September of 2011, um, and these prices will have changed, but it's really the ratio that I want you to see, uh, the difference between Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, I didn't include any frames or arrays because those can vary widely. You can have uh, storage arrays that are tens of thousands of dollars, or quite frankly, there's some that are almost a million dollars. So I just took them out of the equation. This is the media only. And I applied all the standard discounts uh, and the generally accepted storage principles of you don't put uh, more than 80%, you don't fill up a drive by more than 80%. And I also had to count in all of the extra drives that were required uh, by the RAID configurations. And what you can see is that you can save about 25% of your storage costs using a Tier 2 type configuration versus Tier 1. Now, a lot of this is the, uh, the cost of SSDs. Uh, in, you know, at the uh, end of 2011, those SSDs were pretty expensive. They'd come down in price, um, but you're still limited the amount you can use because only the new arrays will support SSDs. So we won't see, you know, really large volumes of SSD storage anytime soon until people are turning over their arrays and buying the newest versions. And finally, the, the choice of RAID actually does impact uh, dramatically because you have to buy all those spare drives um, in an event that the, uh, the drive fails over. So finally, I've added in now the equivalent of what it would cost to have about 100 terabytes of data stored on tape. And really, this is the money shot. If you remember only one thing from this webcast, it's that the tape is 5% of the price of Tier 1 configuration and 7% of the price of the Tier 2 uh, configurations. And remember, so this tape is done, you know, really with the searchability that comes with the active archiving standards and uh, the responsiveness that Spectra makes the data accessible. So this is really dramatic, and, and this is really what I want to leave you with, is that tape as the ultimate storage uh, media, as a storage tier, really can save you dramatic amounts of money if you use it properly um, without really negatively affecting the performance of your storage devices uh, and the, the acceptance of the end users in the delay in getting their data. Uh, tape has that capability of being the place, the, the third tier in your storage architecture. So finally, in conclusion, um, storage tiering um, is really a key uh, in, uh, technology now that you're seeing more and more vendors support and deploy in their uh, infrastructures. Um, again, you know, reserving the best media for your newest data, your fastest data, uh, your most important data. And then as it ages, you tear it down into less expensive and, and slower media. Okay, so that's uh, the result of my report. Uh, this report is available on the Spectra website. And uh, I would be open to any questions you might have about that. So at this point, let me uh, turn the, uh, the uh, mic over to uh, Bob, and uh, we'll let him uh, take us from here. All right. Thank you very much, Dick. Outstanding presentation. And uh, for those of you who have joined us, you've, you've just heard a lot about these different tiers, uh, what our, our peer groups are using to tier uh, when they uh, store information. There's another question that might be asked, and that's how do we move information between these tiers? And Dick touched on that. Um, the Active Archive Alliance is an alliance uh, actually founded by Spectrologic, bringing multiple uh, manufacturers of both hardware and software together to help you use both disk in Tier 1 and Tier 2 and tape as Tier 3 as a primary storage target. It's a very interesting conversation. It's one that uh, obviously uh, uh, is, would would. Uh, require quite a bit of time, so we won't be going into the details of that today. But if you'd like more information, please do go to activearchive.com to find out more about how these different levels of media can and storage can be accessed. Uh, when, when Dick was speaking in one of his earlier slides, he said, best in class has access to archived information in, in 0.3 hours, so uh, about 20 minutes. You actually can get that type of performance 
off of tape if it's not offline storage, if it's online active archive storage via tape. So very exciting ways that you can work with these different uh, mediums and and access information. Before we open it up to Q&A, I do want to uh, say a couple of words about Spectra. Uh, not only were we a, a founding member and an innovator behind Active Archive and some of the markets for tape, we also obviously are a manufacturer of tape automation. And just last month, Storage Magazine came out with their quality awards. Uh, once again, Spectra Logic was selected for our solutions as the number one uh, product provider in enterprise as well as mid-range. So uh, although you will hear the word innovation around SpectraLogic quite often, I like to make the point that that really our innovation is not just around product. It's also around the markets that those products and solutions go into and exploring how we can, can best bring both of those worlds together for our users. Uh, we have released the new LTO6 tape drives with our tape automation. So you now see very small libraries going into a couple of hundred terabytes of information, and our largest libraries literally scaling over an exabyte in size. So if you work tape at that tremendous cost savings into a Tier 3 as an online target for that less accessed information, you literally can grow that uh, uh, throughout the new retention period, which is becoming infinity. No one wants to lose data or information. So with those couple of plugs, we're going to go over to the Q&A. We've had a couple of questions uh, written in, and I encourage you to continue to write those as we uh, pose these questions to, to Dick. And I'll take these somewhat in order, Dick. Uh, the first one is, can you break structured from unstructured growth? So this came a little early in the presentation when you were talking about the rate of data growth, and, and we've got a couple of questions uh, around data growth. But this one is asking specifically, uh, you know, would you, would you consider what percentage of data growth is structured versus unstructured? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question, Bob. Um, and really uh, what the answer comes down to, it varies tremendously by industry. So obviously if you are uh, Nat Geo in the uh, television industry, uh, and you were in the video business, obviously 90% of your volume is going to be unstructured. Um, if you're a, uh, uh, you know, a financial uh, house and you're monitoring uh, transactions on the stock exchange, um, that's all going to go into a large database. And so therefore that would be structured, uh, predominantly structured. So um, the, uh, the rates of structured versus unstructured vary tremendously uh, based upon the industry that you're in. Uh, so uh, I don't really have an overall gross, but that sort of an average really wouldn't apply to very many people because we all tend to exist in industries and then uh, are under the influences that those uh, industries have. Gotcha. And as we see that unstructured, that file system uh, uh, data growth proliferate, is it fair to say that, that, that that's a larger challenge without you know, a database administrator overseeing uh, all aspects of it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also uh, highly more variable. Uh, there'll be periods of time when um, uh, there'll be tremendous amounts of data coming in and then other times not. Uh, when it's structured, it tends to be more aligned to, you know, the fiscal calendar of the corporation, uh, new product launches, uh, you know, engineering tests and dev cycles, things like that. But the unstructured is really, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot as to when that stuff all comes, uh, depending on, uh, you know, some, some sort of news happens, and, uh, and so the social media uh, environment uh, breaks out. And so you have all – and we're finding more and more companies now are actually starting to archive their, uh, their social media, that they actually uh, consider it part of the, uh, the crown jewels or, you know, the, the value uh, of their company, and they need it in, uh, even in lawsuits and things like that. So um, the unstructured is where the most of the growth is occurring, and it's also the most, um, uh, it's the least a planned amount of growth. Okay, great. And several more questions coming in. Uh, are there any well-known cloud services that we know are using tape? Okay, so um, I'm, in, I'm in the industry analyst uh, you know, uh, profession, and so I hear about 
um, companies and what they're doing, and obviously some of that is private. Um, if the cloud service providers tell you about it, then that's you know that's that's how you could get that information. But I really can't tell you that I know that Amazon Glacier, for example, which is an archiving capability in the cloud. Um, I, I suspect I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect that it's heavily taped because the prices that they're able to charge for uh, for that archiving capability. So um, there's some that I know that I can't disclose. There are others that I can suspect, like Amazon Glacier, um, and I'll have to leave it at there. You know, that's interesting, Dick, because we get that question uh, quite a bit as well. And, and just for our, our listeners who are with us today, uh, when you think about cloud service providers, the service they provide, uh, you know, is very competitive between the different cloud service providers. So it's it's often the fact that they don't really want to talk about the details of how they create that service. It would almost be like uh, giving away uh, trade secrets or maybe the, the the recipe to their cookies that they're they're all out there selling. So so that's why you don't get a lot of confirmation about what's under the hood at times. Right. But if if you look as as Dick said at some of the cost ratios that are out there, some of the performance ratios, which is very interesting. What are the SLA the service level agreements that they offer, how long will it take you to get the information back? What you'll see is that often building your own private cloud, having tape accessible as tier one privately within your own data center can beat the SLAs of a cloud service but bring you those same low levels of cost. So so that's why you don't hear a lot about how this is made up, but, but rest assured there are a lot of different parts and a lot of different ways to create this long-term access uh, both uh, publicly or privately. Uh, so again, we, we hear that quite a bit. Next question. Uh, it says, is this TCO? And this came in, Dick, when you were talking about, I, I believe it, it popped up when you showed the three different tiers and pricing. And the question is, is this TCO, how long a time period are we talking about? Okay, so TCO stands for total cost of ownership. And that usually includes uh, the administration, the time to install it, uh, how long you have it, and, and so forth. And the answer is no. Uh, this was a one-shot if I went out and bought 100 terabytes of storage to meet the storage requirements of tier one, this is how much it would cost me. So um, I haven't tried to put any sort of life cycle measurement on it. Um, I also didn't vary it by vendor because uh, different vendors have different quality standards and therefore they price uh, their storage devices at, at a premium. Um, it was really just a one shot uh, attempt to show the difference. It, it really, the, the dollar value isn't as of interest as it is the percentage difference between the tiers. Uh, so the 25% difference between tier one and tier two, that's really what you need to take away from this, this, uh, this webcast. Okay, great. And, and obviously since uh, the you know, acquisition cost uh, is, is a big differential, and then you get the, the cost of energy consumption and such. The yeah. longer time you have any data in storage, uh, you know, the, the more that cost differentiator is going to show up. Exactly. Uh, next question. Can you comment on what LTFS, Linear Tape File System, brings to storage solutions, for instance, the Strongbox solution from Crossroads? Um, Are you I'll familiar – Okay, uh, you know it's it's funny this question popped up because uh, we've been doing a lot of webinars lately. I believe it was just yesterday or the day before. Uh, Spectra did a a uh, webinar specifically with Crossroads. I'd mentioned this Active Archive Alliance and and the whole uh, message there is is bringing access to storage across multiple platforms. LTFS, Linear Tape File System, is new technology as of LTO5 tape release. And it's a way in which, as, as I believe Dick mentioned a little earlier, you can put a file system on the tape with the data. So it makes it uh, easier to access. Um, it's, it's LTFS is applied in many different ways. Uh, by itself, with a single tape drive, what it would do is it would make a tape appear much like a USB key. So you could plug it in and, and, and see the contents uh, you know, very iconically for drop and drag. 
Obviously, when you're talking about big data and you're talking about automated tape systems, that does not do you any good. You can't have thousands of tapes any more than you could have thousands of USB keys to store information. So that's the promise of LTFS as it's incorporated by different manufacturers and vendors. It, they will bring the, kind of the management aspect to present tape as NAS, as net, network attached storage. So just one more way in which you can get that file system extended out past disk and have, uh, have better access to storage. So hopefully that answered that. Uh, next question up, uh, another LTFS. It, uh, it's actually, it says comment. LTFS is a tremendous facilitator to make the use of tape as an active archive. Okay, so that was from one of our participants who had a comment. Um, let's see, I believe we had a, another last question come in. Uh, what backup software manufacturers include the ability functionality in their product to manage tape as an active tier? Symantec, Commvault, et cetera. Or is that always an independent purchase, i.e., is Active Archive a product that is purchased from Spectra or other? Okay, I think that's another one for me. Um, Active Archive is an approach to managing data. It is certainly not a product. So Active Archive is an approach. Uh, what it means is that you are using multiple levels of tiers of storage. Uh, we've already basically seen what could be called Active Archive between Tier 1 and Tier 2 disk storage. There are software manufacturers, uh, uh, Commvault in particular, uh, with their Simpana product, allows you to tear out and have you know, what would appear as primary storage on tape. There are many software manufacturers that do this. Uh, FileTech, QSTAR, you'll find information on most of those at activearchive.com, that website you saw earlier. Um, uh, Crossroads, who was mentioned in an earlier question, uh, uh, their, their product, the Strongbox, is an appliance that would sit in front of a tape library. It sits very nicely in front of the Spectre tape libraries, and it will present the whole library as network attached storage. So many different ways to do that. Uh, and the final question we have uh, is, is very specific. It looks like it's a, uh, one of our current users. It says, we have a Spectra T50E. Do you have any upgrade for the firmware? I'm not sure if I'm going to see the email of the individual uh, who sent that in. We do uh, you know, offer any upgrades on any of our tape libraries. They can be uh, downloaded through the BlueScale operating system through our website. So if you go to spectralogic.com and look under support, it will tell you the latest, greatest for firmware revision. Very easy to pull up your existing revision through BlueScale. If you have any questions, contact our support department with you. More than happy to jump on that. All right, so it looks like, oh, one more. Uh, oh, this is a mention coming from our moderator. I uh, want to remind everyone that we are sending out a link to this recording to everyone who joined us today. So you'll get a link to this reco recording and slide deck. You will also get a link to the uh, paper that has been created by uh, Dick from the Aberdeen Group, Tape the Ultimate Storage Tier. It's close to 30 pages. It's going to give you a lot more in-depth information of the sorts of things that Dick presented on today. So those two links will be emailed to everyone. And I think that is it. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great rest of your week wherever you are, and we will look forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you, Dick, for joining us. Outstanding presentation. Thanks, Bob. Take care.